Ukrainians are marking one year to the day since Russian President Vladimir Putin launched a full-scale invasion of their country. It was about five in the morning when Putin's military fired off the first in a series of missile attacks targeting locations around Kyiv, as well as the cities of Kharkiv, close to the Russian border. They plan to take the entire country in days. But one year on, a grinding war of attrition has set in along a thousand-kilometer front line. Let's take a look now at how Moscow's initial plan faltered and what the next steps might look like as it ramps up a new offensive. One year ago, Russia attacked Ukraine from three sides. In the north, armoured units came over the border from Russia's ally Belarus. There were air and land attacks from Russia itself in the east, and from the south, forces flowed from Russian-occupied Crimea. Russia's navy also attacked from the Black Sea. Ukrainians soon showed that the Russians had underestimated them. A massive column of Russian tanks heading towards Kiev was stopped in its tracks. The battle for Kiev was lost, and it was clear this wouldn't be the quick victory for Moscow that many expected. By April, Russian troops had retreated from the north. They regrouped to focus their efforts on the east and the south. The strategic southeastern port city of Mariupol had been surrounded since the early days of the war. And in May, it finally fell to Russian forces. The city that had been home to 450,000 people lay in ruins. But Russian victories remain few and far between. In September, Ukraine's military surprised Russia with a lightning offensive that took back the city of Kharkiv, as well as hundreds of square kilometres of territory. Ukraine then proceeded to liberate the city of Kherson too, in a major humiliation for the Russian army. Russian troop morale was said to be low. Meanwhile, Ukraine was benefiting from an increasing flow of high-tech Western weapons, including the HIMARS multiple rocket launcher, this allowed Kiev's forces to hit far behind enemy lines, cutting off supply routes and hitting ammunition depots. Since retaking Kharkiv and Kherson, the front line has been mainly stable, with Russia focused on capturing the city of Bakhmut. This is part of an effort to take the entirety of the Donetsk and Luhansk provinces, one of Russia's original stated goals. So what's next? Russia has poured hundreds of thousands of new conscripts into the fight. But the latest offensive, pushing along the front line in the Donbass, has so far yielded no major gains for Russia. Meanwhile, Ukraine is also gearing up for a counter-offensive and is expecting deliveries of dozens of advanced battle tanks from Germany, Poland, Britain and the US. Ukrainian soldiers are also getting training from NATO on sophisticated military manoeuvres. That could help them punch through the Russian lines and take back more territory. How far they can go is another question. It's clear that Kyiv can only keep fighting as long as the weapons keep flowing from its Western allies. And DW's Funny Fachar is in Kyiv for us. I asked her how the atmosphere in the Ukrainian capital compared with last year on this day. I remember one year ago, people really were hastily packing up, skate, trying to leave, and Ukrainian military vehicles rolling, rolling here through the city. Today, I see a lot of people actually just headed to work, and traffic is building up because people, a lot of people actually have moved back to the capital. And when you talk to them about today, many of them don't really want to be reminded of this anniversary because they're being reminded constantly every single day by their bloodshed that plays out in so many parts of Ukraine. People are nervous today, but it's not like it was a year ago where people really in chaos and in panic just trying to get out of the capital. But at the same time, of course, if there's anything positive that people can take away from that fatal day, February 24th, 2022, is the fact that Russia's attempt to take over Kyiv, to 
take over the government here, basically, and control this entire country failed, not only here in Kyiv and the region here in the north, but also in many parts of Kharkiv region. And also Ukraine was able to liberate Kherson city, which, by the way, to date was the only regional capital that Russia was able to temporarily control during the past year. So people, as they wake up and go to work right now, yes, they are nervous, but at the same time, they just want to go on with their lives, hoping that this war is going to mm. end and there is not going to be a second anniversary coming up. But meantime, Ukraine says that it thinks that Russia is preparing a new offensive. Are people expecting it now? We just returned from a, a frontline town and the people obviously are living through that offensive already. They, they are urging everyone who uh, is able to deliver weapons, but also to deliver peace, to, to do that. Uh, so the atmosphere along the front lines is, of course, much different than in the capital where I am right now. Uh, Yes, people are nervous because they just simply do not know whether there's going to be maybe an airstrike or any air offensive by Russia to mark this very grim day. They're hoping that's not going to happen. But at the same time, as I say, they have to live with this uncertainty every single day. And so often, in fact, during this past year, we have heard this word defiant, that Ukrainians are very defiant. Indeed, they are. They are also very resilient. But with one year of this war raging on, they're also very tired and simply traumatized. They really hope that the war is going to be brought to an end, even though obviously nobody knows, and we have just heard in that report, how the dynamics are just going to develop as Ukraine enters the second year of this brutal war. Funny, today, in the past weeks, we've been seeing high-profile visits from world leaders, an overwhelming show of support from the UN General Assembly, billions more in aid pledged by the United States um, and others. How does all of this international goodwill affect people that you speak with on the ground? They definitely see this as a ray of hope, not just in the light of the fact that they want to believe that that military aid, but also humanitarian aid, is not going to uh, cease to stop because they say here, if that stops, that also probably Ukraine is going to stop to exist as we know it now. Uh, at the same time, of course, they really wonder as this war rages on, whether there's going to be some sort of an apathy setting in in the minds publicly uh, across Europe, but also in many parts of the world where people ordinary citizens are struggling with inflation, struggling with, in fact, various governments who are uh, using a, a different narrative on what's happening here in Ukraine, which is because of sanctions, there, there's an increase of prices, energy prices, etc. So they really hope that the interest in what's happening here is not going to vain and, 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 and vanish in some sort, but they really hope that these, all these symbolic remarks by President Biden, for example, by EU leaders, but also as we have play, seen play out in New York yesterday, the UN General Assembly, that all of these symbolic steps are actually going to translate into actions right. to make sure that even though life is probably never going to be the way it was before 24th of February last year, but at least that there's going to be peace, rebuilding both physically, but also mentally here for the people of Ukraine. Fanny Fachar in Kyiv, thank you. Well, the war in Ukraine has been documented by journalists and photographers who have captured searing images of the conflict. They have provided a constant reminder of the human cost of the war on and off the battlefield. Russia invades Ukraine, attacking from air, land and sea. Within days, millions of people fled the fighting, leaving everything. A maternity hospital hit by a missile. For those who stayed behind, towns laid to waste, people brutalized and killed. A steel plant becomes a symbol of resistance, but falls to an overwhelming Russian onslaught. Moments of pride as Ukraine struck back. As winter came, a deadly war of attrition set in. A year on, nowhere in Ukraine is truly safe, in a war that still has no end in sight. 
And DW correspondents have been on the ground in Ukraine from the first day of Russia's invasion. Here, Matthias Bollinger, Fanny Fachar, and Nick Connolly share what they experienced on that fateful day in February last year. When the war started, I was in Slavyansk, in eastern Ukraine, in the Donbas region, and I knew that the war started because my phone rang. We were supposed to swap. Uh, I had been working there for a week, and my colleague Nick was coming to replace me, and I was going to take a train back to Kiev that day. But he called me from his train and told me that the war had started, and then we decided that he would get off the train and we would go and pick him up. We drove then to Kiev by car. Um, it took us quite long because we tried to take some more secure routes, some smaller roads uh, and uh, drove through the country. Where we drove the war was a little bit far. We could sometimes hear something very distant but uh, we were not in the zone um, where fighting was going on, we were quite far from there. We saw people standing, queuing up for money at uh, ATMs, uh, for petrol, at petrol stations, um, and everybody was worried, had worried looks. People were talking about what was going on and nobody knew what was going to happen next. February 24 started for me while I was still asleep right here in this hotel. I remember a loud bang. And by the time I realized this was an explosion, it had been followed by another one. I was confused. I remember asking myself, what's next? With one hand, I was trying to pack up a few essentials. With the other one, I was busy on the phone with my colleagues in the newsroom trying to figure out what to do. I remember being on air for hours and just reporting what I saw unfold here right at Maidan. People scared, trying to leave the capital, Ukrainian military vehicles rolling through the city, the first checkpoints being set up. My cameraman and I, we were just trying to do our best, hold it all together and do our jobs. But of course, this question rang in our heads as well. Is it safe to stay in Kyiv or should we leave? It was the longest day I remember, full of uncertainty, that slowly turned into this ultimate realization Russia's war had begun. When the war began, I was sitting in a train heading east from Kiev to the Donbass for a reporting assignment. And I remember getting on that train with pretty mixed feelings. There was a real sense that the Russian state TV propaganda line was getting more aggressive, that after lots of false starts, this might really be the real thing. But everyone else on that train was just demonstratively relaxed. They were convinced this was just politicking, a bit of grandstanding, that nothing would actually happen. I remember not being able to sleep, just kind of glued to my phone. And then in the early hours, there was that push notification that Putin had given a speech, the Russian troops were crossing the border. And just as I started making sense of all that, the internet connection broke off. And for about 10, 15 minutes at a time, I just had no further information, no ability to contact anyone to find out if this was really true. And this happened a couple of times. And eventually, we started hearing bangs what later turned out to be an attack on a Ukrainian aerodrome we happened to be passing. And I went to the conductor of the train. I said, I want to get off. I don't want to go further east. I don't want to go closer to these Russian troops. And she didn't get it. She just couldn't process it. She couldn't accept that this was a genuinely dangerous situation. I was the only one who got off at that station and it was still before dawn. But immediately people had you know, got in line in front of petrol stations, in front of supermarkets, in front of banks. They were shocked, they were dazed that this was something bigger, this wasn't just in Donbass, but they weren't panicking. That was the kind of extraordinary thing. The national anthem was playing on the tannoys in the town. People were making preparations, but they weren't panicking. 